Okay. Headroom from the roof. Of course, you know, maybe, oh, you, you should know, that we are, Hebron is divided into H1, H2. Uh, H1 is where the new city is, where uh, the Palestinian Authority is. Uh, H2, where the settlements are. Like here, we have the, this uh, new building. It's a military base that uh, was built recently, I think three years ago. Uh, we have Beit Romano, the other building over there. That used to be a school for the Palestinian kids until 81, I think. Yeah, the, the military occupied it. And then, uh, of course, evacuated the kids in, in the middle of the school year. Uh, so they needed to go to a, sh a two-shift uh, school. Uh, since 81 till now, it's a settlement, yeshiva, it's a, a detention place, so many things. Uh, the area where there is like this thing here on the left, uh, this used to be the central bus station for Hebron. But again, it was occupied in the 80s, 81. Uh, the soldiers uh, stayed there and they built uh, a settlement. Of course, it was caravans, not the real building, but now it's been um, uh, dug up. Maybe you can see the diggings somewhere. Uh, uh, I think the plan is to continue uh, a settlement in it, uh, an annex to the yeshiva, and uh, there will be buildings over there, and so on. Uh, we have. Um, Another settlement, you can see from here, but uh, if, if you come this side, you can see the red roof to the right. Yeah, that's the first settlement in the old city. The first, uh, yeah, the first settlement in the old city that was started in uh, 79, 78, 79. Um, it was a group of uh, settlers led by uh, Miriam Levinger. Levinger. Uh, she she was the um, the wife of uh, Moshe Levinger, who started the, the settlements in Hebron uh, in uh, '68. So she led a group of women. Uh, it was Passover, uh, and they they wanted to uh, uh, to settle in the old city. So that was the first settlement. It used to be a clinic for the Palestinian kids when I was a child, or for the Palestinians when I was a child. I used to go with my mother there to get uh, medication or treatment. Uh, so we have um, Beit Hadassah, Beit Hadassah, and then the, the bus station, and then uh, Beit Romano. These three settlements are on the same line. And we have a fourth settlement, if you continue with me, over there. You see the new buildings here? this area, the new buildings. This used to be uh, the, the wholesale vegetable market in the middle. Uh, but not anymore, of course. Yeah, yeah, the soldiers, uh, the settlers took it over on the claim that it used to be theirs. Of course, everything was taken on the claim that this is their property. So we have like a line that, that is the, the biggest settlement in the old city, by the way. We have a line of settler, settlements. The entrance to the settlement is from there, Shohada Street. So it's one line here. And if you continue at Shohada Street, the street where all the cars are, it goes up, up way to Tel Rumeda. Uh, and you can see the building with the flag. That's a military base on top of the hill. That's a military base and settlement over there. Of course, yeah, and the case with all the settlements is the same. A military base and the settlement. And it all starts with the military and then turns into a settlement for security, you see. Yeah, and they care about our safety. <laughs> not, not so much, of course. But they care about the safety of the settlers, not us. Yeah, and if the settlers attack us, it's okay. But if we respond back, it's not okay. We get in trouble. So because of these, Hebron is divided into H2 to protect the settlers and H1 uh, under the PA control. Not anymore, yeah, but still uh, H1, H2. 
Uh, of course, Hebron is uh, surrounded surrounded by military bases. We have the Tel Romeda military base. We have another military base on top of that hill. That's the highest peak from that side. And uh, uh, from the other side, you can see the civil administration. It's the military administration of civil issues, but we short it into civil administration. That's one over there. And there used to be another set, uh, military base over there for maybe for uh, 14 years. It was there, but then they evacuated it. And if we turn around a little bit behind this hill, you see the antenna that is coming up. Mm -hmm. There's a military base on that side. And there's a military base on that side. You see the antenna again? Mm -hmm. That's for connections, wireless and stuff. So uh, there's a settlement over there, and a settlement over there, a settlement over there, behind the hill. Yeah, it's a line of settlements. And a detention place over there. We have another military base. You see, it's something like a fortress on top of the hill where I'm pointing. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. That's a military base in H1. That is against the agreement, the Oslo agreement or the Hebron agreement. Yeah, and it's not allowed to have military bases into uh, the Palestinian authorities' areas. But they created that, uh, that base because it's the highest peak in Hebron. From there, they can watch over all the settlements in the area from different directions, and they can watch over the other uh, settlements behind the hill that we see here. And they can see also the settlements from that side, or the military, the, the civil administration. As I said, that's the highest peak. And to provide protection, security, I hate this word, to provide the security for the settlements here. So we are in a huge military camp. This is where I live. This is where you are now. So you are safe, don't worry. Tell your people that they will be safe if they visit Hebron. Yeah. <laughs> So Shuhada Street, that is from there, you see where the cars are, that's the main street in Hebron, it's about one kilometer. Uh, it goes all the way down, it connects the north of the city to the south, but because I'm Palestinian, I'm not allowed to use it. My front door is at Shuhada Street, I'm not allowed to open it, it's welded shut. Yeah. If I am to visit the mosque, of course I can go from the market, but from here sometimes it's easier for me. I can. If I want to visit my relatives on the other side, I need to go all the way around. Sometimes the gate from here, I will show you. The gate will be closed and I have no access from here, of course. Uh, so I need to take a taxi. To take a taxi costs about uh, 25 shekels for me to go to the other side. 25 shekels is like uh, $7. Why should I pay $7 when I can walk like five minutes and it takes about 45 minutes to drive all the way around because I need to drive if I am to visit that side which is five minutes I need to take a taxi from there if the taxi comes to my front door we will go all the way around 45 minutes to go to go there to go there which is five minutes from my house does cost effort, time, and money. 25 shekels here is, is a good amount of money, and we can uh, buy a meal with 25 shekels. Yeah. And we say, welcome to Hebron. <laughs> welcome to the upper tide. You can see this wall. This wall was put uh, during the Intifada about 22 years ago for security. Uh, from here, uh, this is Palestine. Sometimes not, sometimes it's Israel. On the other side is Israel. This is how the soldiers identify it. For me, it's all Palestine, of course. All Israel. I don't want to be radical, but no. Of memories in that street. I used to go from my house where I live near the mosque all the way to the street to the 
the bus station to take the bus uh, to university. When I was a child, I used to come to this bus station here to take the bus to Jerusalem to go to my school. So no one can say that this is Israel. No, this is Palestine. All the way, it's Palestine. And I can't wipe up all uh, or wipe out all my memories because uh, someone claims that this is Israel or this is theirs. No, oh, it's ours. And I was born here. I grew up here. I played here. Uh, I walked here. I lived here, and I'm still living. Ours. Many times they they yelled at us to go home, go home. This is part of our home, our roof. And why to go home? But uh, they don't like us. They don't like a, a to be visible or to be exposed by anybody. I remember one time I had people staying in the room there. They were from Britain. Uh, of course, I came to check on them in the morning. Uh, they were asking some questions and they uh, taking photos. Then, at a sudden, I was looking at uh, uh, the street down. I told them that the soldiers are coming to my uh, to our house. They were surprised. Why the soldiers are coming? I said, well, you will see. When the soldiers came, they said, you have to go down. You have to go home. And I said, this is part of my home. What is the, the problem? And they said, we don't want anybody to be filming. I said, well, these people are from London and they want to film. Uh, and I, if I want to, to film beautiful Hebron, what should I do? I'm, I'm not filming the, the military base. I'm just uh, filming Hebron. And uh, yeah, yeah, I went to the other roof. It was open. Uh, I stepped to the end of uh, the roof. And I showed them my photo, yeah, my, my phone, as uh, if I'm filming, and said, well, uh, if I step back, I don't see the military base or I still see the military base. If you don't want your base to be in the film or in the photo, you have to remove it from here. But any, I'm interested in Hebron, beautiful Hebron. You see all the view around us is really very good. Yeah. This side, this gate used to, to cut the road. Of course, this was Israel and this was Palestine. So we used to play football here. And the soldiers one time came and said, it was a Friday, and they said, we don't want you to play here. What? What are you saying? And they said, because you are disturbing the people on the other side. And I told him that, okay, we are not going to disturb anybody. What time uh, is there uh, Shabbat? And uh, he said, it's six o'clock. I said, okay, six o'clock. Yalla, it's live. Scared. <laughs> Yalla, it's live. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, he said six o'clock. And I, I said, okay, six o'clock, the kids will not be here. We will stop playing. But he came on six, at six o'clock to check on me. And I told him, I'm a teacher and I keep my promises. I'm a leader here. And we do not lie. Well, when we say six o'clock, it means six o'clock. Uh, another time he came and said, uh, you are not allowed to play here. Why? Because these boys cause trouble. And I said, what trouble? He said, they, they make fire. And I told him, when we play football, you say, make trouble. When they play in the street, they say they make trouble. When they are at home, they make trouble. What do you want from us? And I uh, motioned to the kids to play with the soldiers while I was negotiating with the commander. And so the soldiers started playing football with the kids and uh, the commander liked it. The soldiers are playing and I said, yalla, play, play with the kids. You're here uh, in the football uh, match, play with the kids. And he said, well, uh, I need to check with my commander. He was worried about the weapons, of course. Uh, I told him, we will keep your weapons, don't worry. <laughs> we will watch on them. Uh, so he contacted the commander who was on the, on the roof from there. You see where the barbed wire. Uh, 
and the commander said no. So he said no. I'm not. Uh, I'm not playing with you. But there was one condition when he agreed to play with the kids. Uh, he said, if we win, you will not play here at all. But if we lose, I will tell you, and uh, it, it's a command that no one will come and disturb you. You will keep playing here. That was the condition, if they agreed. So when the commander said no, I said, well, we win. Mm -hmm. We win, and we will keep playing here. He said, OK, you win. Yeah. Wow. Victory. Yes, of course. <laughs> And we are happy with these small victories, you know. It's something emotional. You need to be clever to deal with these uh, soldiers. Even in the hardest times, like these days, it's really very hard. Yeah. The first one in front of my house, the second one uh, near my house, and this is the third wall inside the old city. Of course, this wall separates us from the wholesale market and what is now Abraham Avino. And if you can look closely, it's double wall. Yeah, and it's not double wall. Security. You see this mesh wire here? We put for protection. Now it's for protection. Because on this side, it's uh, Abraham Avino. The settlers from there throw urine, garbage. Uh, sometimes they would power uh, chemical water like bleach, um, uh, gray water. Uh, Anything, we, we, any, we don't know what kind of water they throw. Sometimes rotten eggs. One of my friends who had his shop here, many times got his uh, stuff in, uh, full of uh, rotten eggs. And he used to sell embroidery and uh, Palestinian dresses. Imagine a Palestinian dress would be full of rotten eggs. And settlers sometimes come from the settlement. They go up the roof and go there. And uh, they go into the Palestinian houses. The family that lived here many times got attacked. Sabah al -Nur, many times got attacked by the settlers inside their home because the settlers do not like them. They said, we don't want the family to, to live here. And they ordered the soldiers to come and evacuate the family and well shut the, the doors. Of course, the Hebron Rehabilitation Committee and finished the renovation and the family was moving in. So the settlers objected and the soldiers well did shut the doors. When the, the man of the house opened the, the doors, he got detained and he paid 1,000 shekels fine. Yeah, because he opened his own doors. Yeah, of course. Because of this settlement, Beit Hadassah, which is just uh, right above us, if you go back a little bit, you can film it, uh, the whole neighborhood is closed, locked off. For example, this used to be the gold market. Now it's the trash market. You see, all this trash is from the settlers. And you can see Beit Romano in front of us over there. That's Betulman. It's the yeshiva. It used to be a school for the Palestinian kids. And they were kicked in the middle of the school year. The soldiers occupied it and then it turned into this uh, place. This used to be a bookstore. When I was at university, I used to come and buy my books here. It was open.
the significance of this action is that uh, the kids are in front of the soup kitchen uh, that is uh, uh, following the steps of uh, Prophet Ibrahim and the whole Hajj ritual is again following the steps of Ibrahim and Ismail. So there is like a connection between the two. Uh, Ayat used to be one of my kindergartners. Now she will be in the second grade next year, next school year, inshallah. So whenever she meets me in the street, she gives me a big hug. And she's following the kids because she's happy. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, how can they cover the the cracks in the wall? They can't. They killed the Imam who was uh, leading the prayer. This is another sign. Where is it? Here, these are signs from the bridge. And you're on the women's side. Yeah. When it happened. Yeah, not here. No. Here on this side, the, my two nephews were. And one of them uh, ran out. Uh, the other one, uh, of course, they were uh, six and seven. Uh, the six year old uh, told me that he pulled himself from underneath the bodies that fell over him. And he was hiding behind one of the pillars, watching uh, Goldstein shooting at people. He was scared. So he just uh, protected himself with uh, one of the pillars until he managed to, uh, to come out. At first we thought that he was dead because you know, it took time until he came out. But his brother ran away immediately and he did not wait. <laughs> yeah, you know, children yes. at the end. <laughs> we are talking about a seven-year-old boy who was so scared. So he came out and he was yelling, they killed us, they killed us. It took them so long to come to the mosque, to come back to the mosque to pray. Mm. Yeah, and before the massacre or until the massacre, uh, these two nephews of mine used to come uh, three times a day to pray in the mosque and also to learn to recite the Quran. Mm. But after the massacre, they said, no, we are not going back. I don't blame them. Mm. Uh, when they were so scared. But, uh, yeah. Till now, the, the, the younger one uh, sees nightmares. Mm. And his wife, he's married now and he has children. But uh, his wife says that uh, he sometimes and wakes up uh, screaming.